if you have not a friend in the world, the AAUP or the people you call, they will advise you of your legal rights. They will advise you of what the best practices are. They will give you the best suggestions they can for how you want to proceed. You don't have to be in this alone. Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni. We're joined today by Jonathan Reese. He teaches at CSU Pueblo, and he's a history professor who is also the co-president of the Colorado chapter for the American Association of University Professors, AAUP. Jonathan and I discuss how the AAUP represents faculty, what its primary concerns and objectives are, some success stories that the AAUP has had around the state, and broader concerns about academic freedom and for faculty to have due process with regard to firing and other workplace disputes. So please join us for this Watching Adams podcast. My name is Jonathan Reese. I am a professor of history at Colorado State University Pueblo. I've lived in Colorado since 1999, um, and I'm a modern American historian. So I cover everything in Pueblo from 1877 to the present, and a few things from before that. Uh, my last book was A History of the American Refrigeration Industry. Wow, excellent. Uh, What's that book called? It's called Refrigeration Nation. So it's the only book available if you want to study ice boxes among other things. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> if you'll pardon the pun, it sounds pretty cool. It is, and puns go with it. But I am also more relevant to this discussion. I am co-president of the Colorado Conference of the American Association of University Professors, and I am a member of the National AAUP's uh, Council. If you could just briefly describe what the AAUP is, because I throw that acronym around with many people who look at me like they have no idea. I like to think of it as a trade organization for university professors. It's about 100 years old. It was founded by John Dewey, among other very old, very famous professors who are concerned about academic freedom, the administrators at universities all over the country were having too much influence on curriculum and people were being fired. So they are literally the people who define the concept of academic freedom for the modern world. Chances are, I'm not sure if anyone's ever done it, but AAUP language from various statements over the last hundred years has made its way into your faculty handbook, whether you know it or not. Sometimes it's labeled, sometimes it isn't, because literally AAUP defines academic freedom. In some places where the laws are friendlier, the AAUP is a trade union. Like in Ohio, you can organize and, and have AAUP cards that certify your union member. Uh, but in Colorado, where the laws are not very friendly towards faculty organization, uh, we are what we call an advocacy conference. So a conference of advocacy chapters that simply follow developments around the state, try to figure out if AAUP best practices are being followed at various universities and help advise faculty and administrations about ways they can change so that those best practices will be followed. While we're working on our definition of terms here, can you tell us in your own words what academic freedom is and what it means? Oh boy, that's like a half hour discussion right there. I think the academic freedom is the ability to run your class and your research the way you want to. It's not unlimited. Um, there are obviously things like, if you deal with human subject research, you have to get the design of an experiment or a research approved by uh, an outside board. My subjects are all dead, so <laughs> I, these are not issues for me. That's one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, I think there are certain kinds of free expression that even among professors, you know, things like hate speech that are seriously disturbing and run past the limits of academic freedom. But if you are doing work that is within the very broad umbrella of your discipline, you should be able to do that without interference. Uh, you should be able to teach that work 
and the things you've learned doing that work to your students without interference. And you should be able to decide the way you want to teach that work without interference. Obviously, it has to be effective. And the best people to judge whether your teaching is effective and whether your research is not just path-breaking, uh, but even you know, useful are your peers. And that actually is a nice segue into the other thing that the AAUP is really concerned about, which is shared governance. And under shared governance, the administration would administrate your university and the faculty would determine issues like uh, professor effectiveness. Uh, both in research or in teaching. Let's talk a little bit more about shared governance specifically. This is a topic that's been bandied about a lot at Adam State for recent years, and mm -hmm. I can speak back to surveys conducted at Adam State beginning in 2009, again in 2012 and 2015. Surveys basically found in general that administration was quite happy with shared governance and thought it was working well. Faculty had some misgivings about shared governance and staff really felt that shared governance was not working. Do you see those trends as being common and can you talk a little bit about how shared governance should work in the vision of the AAUP? I think those trends are very common. A lot of people complain about shared governance. All the universities I've visited, and I hear that complaint from other AAUP folks in other states who I know. The way shared governance works, first of all, it is shared governance. It's not faculty governance, and just the same way it's not administrative governance. But the way shared governance works, at least under the sort of broad AAUP conception, is that a university exists for the students. We are there to teach the students. The educational mission is central to what universities do. Therefore, anything that has an impact on education the faculty should be consulted and the faculty should help shape the future of that particular aspect of university life. The further away you get from education, the more administration should have primary control over how that thing shapes out. So what's an example of something that administrators really should have the the precedence when it comes to the issue of shared governance on a university campus? Who mows the lawn? And this is not just, it sounds a little facile, but I really, you take it far away from the educational mission, the university administrators should do everything. Let's go to something that's a little more, a little more fair, the division, the design of a new building. Uh, if you're going to design a new building, there are issues that are well beyond the purview of the faculty, like which architect do you pick? But once you have an architect and you're talking about, say, how big the classroom should be, that's the kind of thing where a faculty administration conversation almost has to happen or you're going to possibly destroy the nature of education at that university for the next 40 years. Uh, and then speaking a little bit about the staff at a university, if like at Adam State, it appears that they apparently are, are the most disenfranchised, they have the least job security, and they feel like they have the least input in terms of how the decisions are made. So what would a staff perspective from shared governance look like? Let me back up for a second. I promise I will get to it. The staff is an utterly valid question and I will get to it. But first, I'm thinking of something I probably should have said at the outset of this interview, which is uh, I'm not an AAUP spokesperson for anything. So when I talk about AAUP ideas, I talk about ideas I've heard as an AAUP member and at meetings of the AAUP National Council and how I interpret them. This is, this is my take on AAUP learning. And actually part of the fun of being an AAUP member is that you have this back and forth between other AAUP members as you try to shape a philosophy and apply that philosophy in your state, both to your campus and to other campuses. And what made me think of doing that little aside before we got there is that I know that the staff is Controversial isn't the right word, but I've heard a, a wide array of opinions with respect to staff. I think the one that I embrace is the idea that staff should be protected by the same kinds of principles that protect faculty, but not quite as much. It gets back to the notion of educational mission. <laughs> staff play an absolutely crucial, vital role in the function of a university, but only some of those functions deal with the educational mission. Uh, so for instance, uh, I happen to think that anyone who's fired from a university should have 
due process before the, they're they're abruptly terminated or told that they can't show up on campus or someone's going to call the cops. And I think that should go for staff as well. There are other people who would not fight that battle quite so strongly as I would. If you teach classes at all, for instance, staff who also double as adjuncts, they're absolutely welcome to join the AAUP. The AAUP in the last 10 years has taken a very hard turn towards the adjunct problem at campuses all across the United States since they're doing something like 76% of the teaching in uh, American higher education today. It's part of that dual function, right? If you teach classes, we want you to join. The rates are prorated so that people with smaller salaries don't have to pay as much to become members. And we will fight just as hard for you as we will for any tenure track faculty member. I wanted to get your opinion on a specific question of staff and faculty at Adams State currently and has been the case for a couple of years now. There's a strong interest in evaluating whether the librarians are in fact faculty or whether they mm. are staff. Librarians in fact um, teach and engage in scholarship much as faculty would, but then there are others who really believe that the librarian's role is much more akin to a staff member than a faculty member. In Pueblo, our librarians are faculty. I love them all. They do great work. I couldn't function without them, particularly as a historian. I think all librarians should be faculty. I'll go one further than that. I actually think all technical support personnel, the people like who run your learning management system, I think they should be faculty too. If it has an important role in the classroom, as learning management systems do, uh, and computers in general do, then you should have the same protections as other faculty. We've found that many faculty, particularly in some areas such as business, are very protective of the idea of faculty and really don't want to, to broaden the tent because they're afraid of what other implications it might have. And administrators feel the same way. So what would you say to those who would push back on you and say, these aren't faculty? This goes back to the question of academic freedom. If I have academic freedom, your academic freedom does not make my academic freedom less important or less valuable. So you, your increase in pay to a, a living wage, they try to set up a Hunger Games situation where there's just this kind of money, this amount of money in the entire university and you all have to fight for it. But if we're talking about titles, you know, the changes in titles don't affect anything. I mean, we are absolutely hell-bent in the Colorado Conference to give both raises and academic freedom protection to non-tenure track faculty in the Colorado Community College system who are just poverty level wages, their food banks and this sort of thing. And, and paying those people a decent wage doesn't have to mean that the business professor down the hall doesn't get his next raise because you're paying other people. You can all fight together for more freedom and a bigger slice of the overall pie. You know, many from outside the academic world, I think it's well known in academia that adjuncts are you know, teaching out of the back of their car because they don't have an office or they're qualifying for uh, low-income housing or, or food stamp programs. But in the general public, the professor is definitely viewed as, you know, a white collar job, someone yep. making what a doctor or lawyer makes because they think that, you know, what a Harvard professor makes is what you at, at CU Pueblo are making. Uh, true. And we are doing our best to make sure that People understand, uh, particularly at the community colleges, the, the working conditions and the pay packages are just abysmal. This is part of what AAUP does. We are interested in raising everybody's wages at every level. We are interested in protecting their academic freedom. We are interested in giving them a greater voice in uh, university management. All of these things tie together very closely. I mean, we can't win all of these battles overnight, but when bad things happen at Adam State, this sets the kind of precedent that can lead to bad things happening everywhere. Danny, your situation, you were introduced to me electronically by Tim McGettigan, uh, who is a friend of mine at CSU Pueblo, and essentially the same thing happened to you. It's a little more in your case, but the same 
kind of thing happened to you that happened to Tim. Tim spoke out. He needed to be, oh, what's the right word? If you're from an administrative standpoint, they decided to cut off his email access. They wanted to make sure that he couldn't talk to everybody at the university through their system at once. Nobody tried to ban him from campus, but that's sort of like the next step, right? If you want to cut somebody's voice off in this day and age, first you cut off their email, then you ban them from campus. And we're against the whole principle of this sort of thing for open communication between faculty, administrators, staff, what have you. And if anybody's voice is cut off, that prevents uh, good solutions from being worked out. I have this joke, which may not be a joke, <laughs> where I, I have this picture of all the Colorado administrators at every university in the state getting together for periodic meetings and saying, all right, what can we do to really blow the faculty's mind this year? <laughs> and it happens. These kinds of things run from campus to campus to campus. I, maybe not all the same way because you're dealing with different circumstances but you know how to deal with pay cuts is certainly something that university administrators talk about how to deal with recalcitrant faculty you can see the tactics that are varied from place to place but they're all sort of the same general playbook the AUP is the other side of that equation right if they get together in their their cushy meetings in some great meeting space with lovely chairs and wood tables and well catered lunches we can't quite give the same <laughs> living conditions if we're talking but faculty have to talk they have to talk between departments they have to talk across campuses they need to talk across state lines mm -hmm. in order to deal with the changes in the modern university and the AUP is at the forefront of planning those conversations and learning from each other and trying to deal with each crisis as it pops up wherever in the country that may be. What would you say to a skeptical faculty member or staff who might say, you know, look, here, here at my university, my administration really does take care of me. They look out for me. We don't need an organization like AAUP because we take care of our own here at Adam State or some other university? The AUP is like an insurance policy. You don't know when you'll need it. You hope you won't need it. But if something happens to you, if you're singled out for something you did because the politics in the state have changed, you're going to need the AUP. To be honest, the AUP will probably come help you anyway, whether you're a member or not. But we count on faculty being empathetic with one another. There's certainly thousands of members across the country who are concerned not just with their own skins, but the skins of other people on their campus and the livelihoods of people all across the United States. Mm -hmm. So we will, we will probably help you no matter what. I mean, but it's better if you join. The resources you can get quicker if you are an AAUP member than if you are not a member, but we will still try to help you even if you're not, if you just give the AAUP a call, whether it's us at the state conference, if you're in Colorado or in the national office or in your, if you're listening to this from out of state, whatever state you happen to be in, somebody will try to help you. So can you talk about some success stories that the Colorado chapter of the AAUP has had, maybe some measurable differences that you see this chapter in Colorado is having done? The Colorado conference of the AAUP's greatest success, I think, has been in its legislative arm. We have literally changed Colorado law to improve the circumstances of professors all across the state. Most notably is a law that we sponsored and helped a Fort Collins legislator write, which allows for multi-year contracts for adjunct faculty. So instead of waiting every single fall for the new contract to come in, it is legal for any university, any public university in the state, to sign you up for a three-year contract, which is just a huge relief to the people who benefit from that. You have to ask for it, and we now have been going around telling people you should ask for it, and the university should do it. Our adjunct campaign has done great things in the community college system as well. Tremendous media exposure from Westward and Colorado Public Radio show up at at meetings, we have uh, lobbied to save people's jobs when they have been unfairly targeted for one thing or another. That doesn't always work, but it has 
worked in a few cases. People who've been retaliated against by having their course load downloaded, for instance. Um, and we've hooked up a lot of people in Colorado to other resources that the AUP is aware of. Uh, we helped find my friend Tim as lawyer, for instance. Can you talk a little bit about issues of tenure? Tenure is not what it once was. I mean, it was never absolute job protection as anybody who's ever had tenure actually knows. But tenure is something that more universities all over the country have been willing to violate. Firing people without due process, firing people for things that should be protected speech, and occasionally they get away with it. They will just eat the lawsuit, give a settlement, count on the faculty member not being able to keep the lawsuit up long enough in order to eventually win it and get that faculty member essentially disappeared. And so when you use the phrase due process, yes, what do you mean by that? Should, What's good due process? There should be a hearing. Uh, the hearing should have members of the faculty on that hearing. The faculty member should be able to explain why they did what they did, why they, th they did what's protected. It should be reviewed by unbiased people. What do you think of the, the general idea that if, if we remove someone first, then they're not entitled to due process because they're a non-student, they're a non-employee, and it's, you know, it's, <laughs> right? The, the sort of sequence of events here uh, becomes Danny, important. Danny, Danny, Danny. It's funny because I don't, this is the first time we've met. We've exchanged a few emails. And so on one level, I don't know you from a hole in the ground. But I know enough about your case to know that something is deeply disturbing there. That if you've done anything that was a threat to anybody, your administration should call the police, right? That there shouldn't be two sets of justice, the civil justice system and the Adam State University justice system. <laughs> so uh, God knows what specific stuff they're talking about. I wouldn't even begin to claim I know any of it. But if any of it is an actual threat to public safety, they should call the police and you should be in the Huskow. Since you are not, and since they have had ample opportunity to file charges against you for anything you might have done, I know at the very least I support you in principle because if it can be done to you, it can be done to anyone else at that university, including tenured faculty if someone in the administration thinks that they want to make somebody disappear. In November of last year, uh, you and the co-president, Stephen Mummy, wrote a letter to Adam State expressing concern with regard to my treatment, but more generally this concept of the persona non grata policy. Yes. Can you talk about the, the PNG as it's become known and, and why AUP is concerned about these? Well, it's really what I just said. Again, if it can be used against you, whether you're staff, faculty, whatever, it can be used against faculty. It can be a way of threatening people who might say things that are uncomfortable and preventing a full exchange of ideas. Universities should allow for the full exchange of ideas. If there is some problem with any particular piece of your speech, then that particular incident should be reviewed separately rather than simply wiping out someone's ability to engage in that conversation by banning them from campus. And then on, on the issue of the First Amendment, because the First Amendment and academic freedom have some overlap, but they're also somewhat distinct. Can it's, you talk about that? Yeah, it's confusing, and this is actually a developing part of the law. Oh, I won't, I won't even get the full name of the case, but essentially the Garcetti case before the United States Supreme Court, I think it's 2006, suggested that the closer somebody's speech is to the normal performance of their job, the less protected they are. The implications for faculty are enormous for this because if you are trying to assert shared governance and they don't want you to assert shared governance and they can fire you because your speech isn't really protected, then the whole structure of shared governance and academic freedom is just simply going to disappear. My understanding of this is that a variety of federal courts have had the opportunity to apply this Garcetti rule to academia, and none of them have stepped up and done it yet. But that doesn't mean it won't be done in the future. 
we in the AAUP tend to think of free speech not just as a constitutional right, although we do believe that it should be protected on that basis. Free speech and academic freedom are tied to shared governance and the successful running of universities. So you should have it not just because you're a citizen, you should have free speech because your university will ultimately work better if you have that. So we would protect it in two ways, not just one. Can you talk about what the AAUP's position or some of your thoughts are as an individual on issues like safe speech uh, or uh, safe zones for speech or, you know, issues of, of trigger warnings and the, the kind of these issues that have come up recently that make one scratch their head and wonder how much free discourse there is on the well, university campus. Trigger warnings give me hives. Uh, I think that people should listen to things that make them uncomfortable. I think that's the process of education. Some of the other things you mentioned, like safe zones, I think need to be assessed on a case-by-case basis. And I don't think that anyone, a single sentence, should be fired for the basis of a single sentence. It would have to be a heck of a sentence. How about that? (laughs) Have you noticed a pattern of of more uh, faculty and staff? I know in some previous podcasts I've done, we've noticed this trend where people are are told, um, you have until Tuesday at noon to resign. And so by creating this kind of structure, one in administration can argue, oh, no, 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 we didn't fire the person. They resigned. They decided it was in their best interest to leave. And so they... That is why you need the AAUP. If you have not a friend in the world and somebody has told you that, the AAUP are the people you call. They will advise you of your legal rights. They will advise you of what the best practices are. They will give you the best suggestions they can for how you want to proceed. You don't have to be in this alone. That is why you need the AUP. You cannot just be disappeared. Or if they do attempt to disappear you, and you want to make sure that you do not disappear without a trace, the AUP will help you leave a trace so that at the very least, even if we can't get your job back, we can help warn people not to come to that university because people periodically get disappeared. Do you think the AAUP is fighting a losing battle? Or do you sincerely believe that that some or all of what you've talked about is achievable? The only weapon the AAUP really has is the power of shame. We can send letters, we can point out best practices, we can explain the differences between those best practices (laughs) and what this particular university is doing. And in some cases, universities actually will change. The one I think of the most these days is the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, which is really interesting because Steve Salida, the guy who did those tweets that um, some of the donors to that school didn't like. This is in support of Palestine or something of that nature? Yeah, Yeah, or Mm -hmm. anti-Israel, depending on how you take the individual tweet. He ended up settling, uh, got a a relatively rich settlement. So you might think of that as a failure because he still doesn't have a job. But the AAP put Illinois almost immediately on its censure list. Uh, You combine that with the power of an academic boycott of Illinois, and Illinois is right now scrambling. Don't treat this as as AAUP official. Uh, But my understanding is that Illinois would like to get off that list. They want to have their best practices. They want us to certify that they're doing things the right way now so that this sort of thing will never happen again. I think that's a triumph. While, say, um, Louisiana State... A woman named Teresa Buchanan was fired from their education department, allegedly for um, using profanity in class, which seems a little crazy when you think about it, because anyone can turn on TV at night and see plenty of profanity these days. But LSU was already censured. So they were already on the censured list. And I think they are in the process of being, like, re-censured. Maybe that's the wrong way to put it. But there's another investigation from the AUP that's going to be part of that file. 
And all we can do is warn people, if you take a job at Louisiana State, um, they're not going to respect your rights. Uh, and I'm not sure Louisiana State's ever going to change. Again, this is not official Washington information out of AUP. These are just things I hear um, going to meetings, reading the higher education press. So in some cases, I think it is effective. In some cases, it's not. But if we can make things even a little better, I still think it's worth the effort. Uh, with the glut of PhDs out there, the number of people looking for teaching jobs, the number of people thankful to have a job at all, are faculty really in a position to to organize, to bargain, to boycott, to do some of the things you're describing? Do faculty have more power than they realize? Well, they certainly don't if they won't talk to one another. And so bringing faculty together inside the umbrella of the AUP is the first step. Sometimes faculty can really affect change. Um, sometimes bargaining can really affect change. Sometimes both these things will be met with such stiff resistance that nothing is going to happen. But I think it's better to try than not to. How did things get this way? Now we're in higher education scholarship grounds here. I mean, essentially, state support for public universities began decaying in the oh, early 1970s, I think, is about where it starts. It accelerated in the 90s. The number of adjunct faculty increases in response to that. The conditions of the various universities worsen because of that, except in places like business schools where there's independent sources of funding, which then leads to a sort of corporatist attitude throughout higher education, which then means that people want to take back various freedoms that were conceded in the 50s and 60s, and you have just one long nonstop clash. And the AAP is an independent voice for faculty and a resource for faculty that makes life better for a lot of people, which is where I think it should be in Adam State and any campus that really cares about people other than themselves. So your advice to a probationary faculty or uh, uh, an adjunct faculty or others, even tenured faculty who, um, who believe in what you're saying, they're hearing this and they're thinking that, that they want to be a part, but they're also fearful of retaliation. They're also afraid of uh, how this might reflect if they're seen associated with AAUP, how that might reflect on their aspirations for tenure or for a chair position or to, to be, God forbid, moved into administration someday. Oh, I'll be honest. There are schools, tend to be community colleges, where AUP membership is seen like joining the Teamsters. This is a big black mark and something needs to be done about it. I don't know if it means instant firing or not, but there is some level of harassment. I've heard those stories. I've heard those stories out of other universities in Colorado. A good administration will know that the AUP is a 100-year-old faculty organization that set the standard for good governance and academic freedom and will embrace the membership of its faculty in the AUP because then they can begin a dialogue among peers, if not actually equals, in order to make the university a better and happier place. I think of it this way, right? You can go with the carrot or the stick. And some people are all stick all the time, but the best administrators will at least go for the carrot periodically. And the AUP is, maybe it's the carrot. I don't know, we can all have the same carrot together. My metaphor is breaking down, but um, it's a good thing. And if your administration is worth its salt, it will embrace the fact that there's a chapter forming and won't try to discourage it. Back to what you said a minute ago about the corporatization of higher education, uh, as we saw in 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Should higher ed be run like a business? Oh, I don't think so. I think uh, higher ed is a public good. It's not a business. If you do everything for profit, you'll obliterate the quality of the education you provide. It's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. There are certainly many people, dare I say, who are on boards of trustees who come from a different background and a different perspective. And what they bring to the university looks much more like what they would bring to the boardroom at a corporation or something of that nature. And so they're very concerned about education as a product and it's delivered and students are the consumers and they buy it. And, you know, all of these faculty are the laborers and they're working on the factory floor to produce the education. They need to be educated. 
And the best way to do that is to invite the members of your board of governors or whatever board it is to your AAUP meetings and let them know what you really do and let them know how they can help. Cut out the middleman. That doesn't mean they won't talk to your administration as well, but your administration does not have a monopoly, sole exclusive right to talk to the people who run the university the same way that you don't have a monopoly to have sole exclusive right to talk to your students. We've talked a lot about how the AAUP may benefit faculty, even sometimes administration and staff uh, as a result of you know, a more equitable workplace and uh, free exchange of ideas. How does this percolate down or even directly benefit students themselves? Why should students care about the university they go to being in good standing with the AAUP? Because a classroom where there is academic freedom is a better classroom. You can talk about something because you think that students should know about it rather than say to yourself, if I talk about this, am I going to lose my job? The free exchange of ideas is good between university administrators and faculty. The free exchange of ideas is good between faculty and students. The free exchange of ideas is good between students and students. So academic freedom is something that faculty have, students have it too. And the AUP will fight for that protection as well. Restrictions on your professors is just an indirect way of restricting what you can learn. And that is a, that's bad for higher education, that's bad for society. Certainly in my case and in many others, the, the specter of, you know, Columbine and kind of the post school shooting environment we live in has uh, forced us to ask ourselves at what price liberty, right? Uh, how much free speech is okay <sighs> before we start, you know, uh, creating an unsafe environment and the administration's role is to protect students. I think this goes back to the um, pepper spraying at UC Davis from about five years ago. The students aren't doing anything wrong. The university police pepper spray them. They end up with a very large financial settlement, if memory serves me well. And you could say safety, safety, safety. This is a restriction from safety. I think that you can keep everybody perfectly safe without clamping down on the free exchange of ideas. You know, the crazy thing, I'll talk about my friend Tim again for a second. They at least very strongly implied, I have no special insight into that case, but as an observer, they at least strongly implied that he was somehow and at least an indirect threat to public safety by his use of the email. To which my suggestion was that if he wanted to email the entire campus, he should get a Gmail account, write down all the emails that are publicly available, and hit the entire campus from the outside, because that's the way email works. Uh, and I think that's just a good example where any implication of public safety is, is clearly a uh, pretext. Because if you're really interested in public safety, they would have taken him off the campus in handcuffs rather than simply cut off his email. Because it is possible to email everybody if you put in the work without using the university system. They just wanted to make it much more inconvenient for him to express his speech. So I, again, I think that balance between safety and free expression is easier when you just put the little bit of scrutiny to what's being done in the name of public safety. Why don't administrators simply use existing law enforcement tools more? I mean, we've wondered aloud at Adam State in a town as small as Alamosa, why we need our own police force or why, you know, the, the police department is about four blocks from Adam State University. I don't know. I really don't know. I try very hard to be the kind of faculty member who is willing to work with my administrators. One of my best friends in the world is the ex-provost. He's retired now, um, and we got along really well, and I was just as AUP-ish when he was provost as I am now, even before I joined the AAUP. You can come together and treat people as peers, if not equals, and you can learn from one another and create a really excellent university environment, or you can go it alone. And the people who go it alone, it's hard for me to get in their heads because the only way I can get in their heads is to talk to them, and they won't talk to me because they're going it alone, <laughs> or at least talk to me seriously. There are plenty of administrators who will sort of make noises about shared governance, and it won't actually be shared governance. 
Um, so it's just very hard for me to get into the administrative mindset um, to answer that question. Uh, but in your case, I just think it's it's just very simple. There's a whole set of laws that already exist in the books for everything they seem to be implying about you. Those should be used simply because it's the right thing to do. Uh, we've touched on a number of different areas, including the rise of the, the adjunct uh, professor teaching more and more of the, the course load at a university. I wanted to touch now on what the AAUP's thoughts or what your thoughts individually are on um, online classes, on extended studies coursework. Oh, oh Danny, that's another hour. <laughs> <laughs> that really is another hour. Um, let's go with this. I'm going to go, I'm going to limit this to the relationship between online classes and academic freedom. And I think this should be 100% obvious. I'm actually at the front lines of this at the National AAUP, um, but I'll go with this as just a blanket statement where I believe the AAUP is going and I'm trying to push them there. You do not give up academic freedom because you are teaching online, so period. Indivi just to clarify for those listening, uh, many professors who develop a course have, have from the outset, a, a choice between basically getting paid less to, to teach the course uh, with, with your own syllabi that you own, or you get paid more once uh, for the university to own the, the syllabi and, really? and kind of the underlying. And so a lot of faculty that are in the mindset to teach extended studies are doing so for supplemental income reasons. And so they will forfeit over some or all of their academic materials to the university, you know, to, to be able to do that. That is the most disturbing thing I have ever heard. And I think it's gross. And I think it's a good way to have really bad online classes. Why? because it promotes cookie cutter classes that vary very little between disciplines and even within disciplines. And I think one of the wonders of higher education is that you get to deal with a whole bunch of different professors who teach sometimes similar, sometimes dissimilar subjects in their own unique ways. I once heard the head of CSU Global, the online arm of our Colorado State University system, brag that every web page at her online university has the same exact structure to which my immediate reaction was that's not the way the world wide web works why do you want your university to work that way uh, you want to have people who can not just take an online class but navigate the world wide web itself in a thoughtful way well it's fast food higher education well, you get I, all of your products in little contained boxes that then can get distributed right? well i'm well beyond aup policy here but i'm <laughs> individually a believer in faculty-centered online education, that you can create really wonderful courses or have face-to-face -face classes that use online tools uh, by giving faculty members the power and the resources to choose which online tools are best for their individual classes, their individual teaching styles, their individual pedagogical objectives inside their class. So the idea of the university owning the course just deeply, deeply disturbs me because it will sacrifice almost by definition quality for convenience. Wow, I've never heard that, but I guess I'm not surprised. I mean, I am surprised, but the more I think about it, I think it's like the next logical step on your way towards for-profit education. And for-profit education is gonna interfere with most people's educational mission to create quality courses. I think you can do fantastic stuff online. I've seen it done, I'm trying to do it myself. It takes work and it takes freedom to be able to call in the resources that are best for achieving the goals that I'm trying to achieve in class. I, if you uh, just or handed a cookie cutter course and said, teach this, this is the first step to being de-skilled. And then the teaching process gets automated and pretty soon we're all out of a job. So going into your presentation to Adam State today, what are some of the main takeaway points that uh, for those who weren't there, what would you want them to take away? If there's just one thing that they should know about the potential for AAUP involvement at Adam State. You have more rights than you think. Just because you haven't utilized them doesn't mean that you don't have them. And I'm not so much talking about your legal rights, but more of like the prerogatives you have as a professor. You should be able to teach your own class. You shouldn't be afraid of being disappeared if the administration doesn't like you. You shouldn't be afraid of being banned from class uh, or campus. Um, and you have friends in academia 
who will help educate you as to what these rights and prerogatives are and will help you assert them if asserting them becomes a struggle. So I think more than anything else, what those of us who are visiting from elsewhere today to help Adam State want to bring to you is, is knowledge. Knowledge about what the best practices are, how they've been worked out under 100 years, and to help you apply the principles that we're bringing, the stuff in that red book I was talking about, to your campus moving forward. It only takes really one or two people to know what's going on to help the entire faculty. I have this sort of nightmare where me or my friends or someone is sort of picked out as, actually it's happened to my friend, it happened to Tim, it happened to you, that this picked out by the administration and said, you, you're the problem. And they'll do it publicly and they will shame you and try to run you out of the profession and destroy your livelihood. This happens to people all over the country these days for the strangest reasons. People have tried to have me fired twice, actually, but I don't want to get into that. Where these kinds, and you think it's only you, but it's, it's not, it's potentially everybody, but there are hundreds of people who are suffering quietly under very stages of this oppression. I'm one of them, not to the degree that you are. Tim is one of them. There are people who you would find very sympathetic in this position. There are people who you wouldn't find very sympathetic at all in this position, but we want to help those people wherever they are because their rights are our rights. If you can't protect people who are trying to do things that are a little outside the box, the box will never ever expand. And not just higher education, but society will be the poorer because of it. Thank you for joining us.